Welcome to the iSpace Virtual Workshop. Today we're going to talk on how to design Orthocade Forge lenses. This is an introductory session. Um, it's primarily focused towards people who are starting with iSpace or who would like to use iSpace to design more optimal Orthocade lenses. So let's look at iSpace for a moment. Uh, this is the iSpace Lenses website. And as you can see, we offer a turnkey solution to specialty lens practices. We offer a number of products and we also provide backing, track and trace and administrative services to you. On the iSpace website, you will be able to see our blogs. Please spend some time there and look at the cases we've put up. And we also put other interesting information in there. We have a find a practitioner section on the website which uh, people from the public can go and look and see where the closest iSpace practitioner is. We also provide a comprehensive range of a patient resources that you can hand out to patients and also keep in your practice for referencing. One of the unique features of iSpace is our track and trace system. It offers you a full backend solution to managing your lenses from lenses that you've ordered. Each lens comes with a serial number. If you enter the serial number into the back end, it will bring up all the details of that lens, including when the lens have been ordered, the whole manufacturing process, and there's also a copy of the design on the back end. So at any time, you can access the back end, download the file to your iSpace desktop software, and you have it available. Other features is our orthokeratology certification process, especially for practitioners from the US. Uh, this is for your FDA approval, but anybody can please uh, enter and then do the Forge Orthocase certification to approve you as a fully fledged fitter. We also offer a comprehensive knowledge base, which is constantly updated. And all the information I'm gonna offer you today will be available on the knowledge base for you to reference at a later stage. Another unique feature of iSpace is we offer live support. So on the image there at the top, we have Darren. He supports the US regions. At the bottom left, we've got Mariska. She's looking after South African areas. Uh, we've got Kendra on the right there, which is looking after Australia. And then we have myself and Alan Benjamin looking after the New Zealand regions. So at any point, if you have any questions, any concerns, or require any troubleshooting, please feel free to contact any of these persons who would be more than willing to assist you with your orthocade fitting. So let's have a look at iSpace. iSpace, the desktop is free. You, there's no subscriptions, there's no monthly or annual fees. All you have to do is open an account and you can download the software at no charge to yourself from the iSpace online website. You can also download it on any amount of computers. So if you want to add it to your work computer as well as your private home computer, feel free to do so. For more information, please have a look at iSpaceLenses.com. All the information is posted up there. Let's pull the curtain a bit away from iSpace and let's look at the functionality of the design screen and how to design K lenses. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with iSpace, it might be a bit daunting, but what we've done is we've broken it up into three sections, three columns. Column A, which is your patient management or data management. The middle section, column B, which gives you your corneal data and lens design and the section on the right, which is the simulation area. It's the language of optometrists. It's the stuff we visually understand. So let's have a look at that first column. So the column on the top will provide all the information regarding the topography maps that you have imported into iSpace. In this example, we have the Medmont, uh, topography map there at the top section. It also gives you a date stamp of when that map was captured on the Medmont system. Beneath that, we've got the different lens designs that was 
design of this topography map, again with the date stamp, so that you can see when you design those lenses. By right-clicking on any of those lens designs, you can duplicate that design, or you can delete the design, and if you right-click on the Medmon file or the Oculus file, you can delete the topography map as well. The middle section is where the coronal data is located. So we've got the design of the lens on board. We have the flat and steep K values, the delta K, the delta sag at nine millimeter, which we'll talk about, and the measured HVD, as well as the spectacle prescription. And underneath that, we have the lens matrices the design parameters of the lens. In this example, it's a rotation symmetric lens, and with that, it's back optic zone radi radius values, as well as the advanced parameters, which we'll talk to you about in a minute. Then the last section is the display area. Now, as I said, this is the language that optometrists understand. If your eyes follow to the bottom section, that's the lens simulation of the lens on eye. That simulation is very accurate. And later on, I'll show you how accurate it really is. But what you see there is what you can expect to see with the lens on the eye. So if the design there does not look appropriate, odds are somewhere in the design or in the captured map, something is defective and one needs to review that before ordering the lens. The top section is a cross view of the tear form profile over the horizontal meridian and underneath that will be a cross section of the tear profile in the vertical meridian. Now by default when you open this page or when you uh, make any changes to the lens parameters the design will always default to simulation over the horizontal and vertical meridian. Another area to note is that central tear form area. That five microns in this example um, is important for us as we have to make sure we've got the right central tear form thickness. So that's not an actual value, a dot value, but an average value of the central tear form thickness. So let's have a quick look at the basic design elements of the Forge Ortho K lens. And the first one is the back optic zone radius or treatment zone. Now in Ortho K, we do move away from the term back optic zone radius and generally use the term treatment zone. And the main reason for that is for most GP fitters, old school GP fitters, we've been programmed to think when we want to make changes to the fit alignment of the lens, we will do that by changing the back optic zone radius. Now this is not the case with ortho K lenses. The treatment zone or the back optic zone radius is the to control the amount of myopia that you want to correct. And so we do not want to change the back optic zone radius to change the fit alignment of the lens on the eye. So in generally, we will talk about treatment zone size just to differentiate the thinking philosophy of changing the back optic zone radius to make changes to the lens fit. So let's have a quick look at how the treatment power uh, relates to the back optic zone radius value. So a basic ortho K formula for determining the back optic zone radius is to take the flat K value in the optus, subtract from that the target power, the amount of myopia that you want to correct, and then an extra factor, a compression factor, which is typically called the Jessen factor. It's a fudge factor, really. So what was initially found that if you only subtract the target power from the flat K, the ortho K lenses did not reach the intended target power. So initially a minus 0.75 diopters was added just to create, get to the right target power and research later done by John Mountford and company found that in most cases it was better to use minus 1.25 diopters. iSpace works a little bit differently in the sense that we have a sliding scale. So the lower the amount of myopia that we're going to correct, the less that lesser that compression factor will be. The more minus we are correcting, the more compression factor will be added to the lens design. So you'll notice a minus two lens 
will have a different compression factor or jettison factor compared to, for instance, a minus eight lens. You don't have to worry about this. The software will calculate this automatically on the back end and then provide you with the correct back optic zone radius. It's just for you to know where that value is coming from. So again, that compression factor is an extra factor. Now, because that's added, that's a tear film power that's added, that needs to be corrected on the front surface of the lens. And that's why all ortho -K lenses that corrects for myopia, for minus, will have some form of plus back vertex power. In other words, when you take the lens and put it on a photometer, you'll measure some form of plus in air. That plus is to correct for that extra compression factor, adjacent factor. So if you want to know what value was used, just see what the plus value is in your photometer and you know where that extra compression factor was. So as I said, the back optic zone radius, the function of the back optic zone radius is to control the amount of myopia we would like to correct post fit. It does not control the alignment of the lens. So if your lens is tight fitting or loose fitting, changing the back optic zone radius won't improve that. That is where the alignment curve comes in and which we'll talk about in a minute. So let's look at the Z zone or Z zone. Now the Z zone controls the overall apical height of the lens on the cornea. So if we look at this image, if we look at the back optic zone radius where it stops, that's where the reverse curve starts, comes down, and that's where the alignment curve starts. So if you can use your imagination, that looks like a Z or a Z. And that's where the name comes from, the Z zone or Z zone. So it's commonly called the reverse curve, sigmoidal curve, return curve, it's got many names, but essentially it does the same thing. It controls the overall height of the lens on the eye. So the way to think of this, the back optic zone radius is the roof of the house. The Z zone is the wall of the house and the alignment curve is the foundation of the house. So if I want to increase the height of the roof, I want to increase the length of my wall. I want to add more bricks into that wall for the roof to be higher. If I want to decrease the height of my roof, if I want to bring the back optic zone radius closer to the cornea, I will then remove some of the bricks. I will make that Z zone a bit smaller, make my wall a bit less in length, and the roof will lower down. So the Z zone controls the overall height of the lens, the sagittal height of the lens on the cornea, and therefore it will control the central tear film thickness. So if you want to increase the central tear film thickness, you want to increase the Z zone. You want to add more bricks into that wall to raise the roof. If you want to decrease the central tear film thickness, you're going to take bricks out of that Z zone. You're going to reduce the Z zone value so the central back optic zone radius comes closer to the cornea. So as a guide, as a rule of thumb, when you deal with myopia cases below minus five diopters, the central tear film thickness should be somewhere between 10 and 20 microns. If we're dealing with higher minus cases, your central tear film thickness will be a bit more. You're gonna move it more towards the 20, 30 microns level. The reasoning behind that is as we mold the tissue, and we'll talk about this, the overall sag of the lens on the cornea will drop over time. So we need a bit of reserve space in the center. So as the lens comes closer to the cornea, as the reshape progresses, we're still allowing enough space so the back optic zone radius does not touch the cornea and cause central staining. So there is a range where we are safe and there will be a range where it's gonna to be too close to the cornea and a range where we are too far away from the cornea. By default, the suggestion is whatever eye space calculates when we optimize it, please stay with that value. And only if you have to troubleshoot, for instance, if you see central staining, you would go back with your second lens and then increase the Z zone, increase the central tear film thickness to allow a bit more reserve space 
then in the center. So if we look at the design element, um, looking at the parameter, this is the Z zone on the software. That value currently is 265 microns. It's a value that controls the height of the Z zone. In this example, our space in the center there is 22 microns, the central tear film thickness. If I go ahead and I decrease that central tear film thickness, we drop the overall sagittal height of the lens by 20 microns. And in the example here, you can see it now shows a zero central tear film thickness. If I go back just to show you, currently at 265 microns, we've got 22 microns of central clearance. If I drop it by 20 microns, I now also decrease the central tear film thickness. We'll talk about those blue patches in a minute. But know that the blue that you see in that simulation on the bottom right is neither good nor bad. It just shows you where the area of most bearing, of most weight is under the lens. So the lens bearing should always be underneath the alignment curve over the horizontal meridian. In this case, we have it. We've got the blue on the alignment curve on both sides, but we also have blue in the center. That's what we don't want. We don't want any central lens bearing on the cornea. So we need to increase the central tear film thickness. The opposite is also true. If I increase my Z zone to 285 microns, you'll notice that the central part have now increased to 40 microns. Now, if you just look at the simulation and don't even worry about the numbers, instinctively, from that simulation, you can see something is wrong. You can see we do not have enough central compression. We don't have that slightly darker area in the center, which we typically want to see with a bullseye pattern. So without having to know all the numbers, we can instinctively see from the simulation if our design is on point or if we need to make any design changes. And that's the beauty of the simulation. It's the language we understand. It's the language of optometry. So the final area we're gonna pay quick attention to is the alignment curve. Now the alignment curve is that outer section of the lens that controls the lens positioning on the cornea. But it also has another function. It helps with the molding process. So if you imagine the center part, the back optic zone radius applying downwards pressure, that tissue is moved into the reverse curve. But we also want pressure coming from the outer periphery and we want that corneal tissue to be pushed from the outside inwards into that reverse curve. So we've got these dual forces coming from the center and from the outer periphery, pushing that epithelial tissue higher up into the reverse curve. And that's the secret of high minus correction, is you need a proper seal in the periphery as well. And so that's the function of the alignment curve. It helps with centration, but it also helps with peripheral to central molding, which is essential for high minus fitting. And I'll show you later on how we control those elements. In the design software, it will be represented by this value here, the alignment curve. In this example, the horizontal or flat meridian is at 6.5 and the steep meridian will be underneath it. So I'd like you to look at the simulation here. That's in the horizontal meridian, there's two line engravings. Now these line engravings will be physically engraved on your Forge Ortho K lens as well when you place a toric order. Now those flat uh, meridian lines, those engraving lines will show you where the flat meridian is of the contact lens. They won't necessarily lie at zero or 180 degrees or 90 or 270 like you can expect with soft toric lenses. They will rotate wherever the cornea dictates the lens will settle which is where the flat meridian of the cornea is going to be. So they show you the orientation of the flat meridian relative to the cornea. And wherever you see those engraving lines, that line, that zone corresponds to the flat meridian and the opposite 90 degree where you see the serial numbers 
will be where the steep meridian is. And this is important to remember when we're dealing with, for instance, against a rule fit, where the flat meridian will sit in the 90 to 270 degree meridian. The alignment curve is also linked to the um, alignment curve eccentricity value, which you see at the bottom currently 1.2. So the eccentricity is linked to those two values. And with iSpace, we can manipulate any of those parameters. So we can then increase or decrease the eccentricity of the alignment curve to allow better alignment with the particular cornea that we're trying to fit. So in our example here, you can see we have the horizontal meridian, which is 6.5, the alignment curve. The vertical, we've got 6.4, and the eccentricity here is 1.2. Now on the simulation, on the cross section, that's where the alignment curve is located. I notice that the tier profile here makes a slight U shape, and that's what we're after. So if you can imagine the cornea, we want the eccentricity of the alignment curve to be slightly more to what the cornea is. We want a slight slee slope or ski slope sitting there, allowing tear flow in underneath. We don't want any sharp edges and it pinches onto the cornea. So we want that uh, alignment curve just to be slightly more eccentric than what the outer peripheral eccentricity of the cornea is like. And what we after is that area of bearing, that little blue zone that you see there. So in our simulation, you'll notice the blue zone sitting over there. We want a nice even wide blue patch sitting over the alignment curve. Again, the blue is neither good nor bad, but we want a solid, well-aligned alignment curve sitting on that area. We want a nice bearing on that area. And that helps us with molding, especially those high minus powers. So what happens if we increase the eccentricity? So in this example, the eccentricity was increased to 1.5. And you'll notice that that U-shape is now exaggerated. So there's much more of an aggressive Q-shape sitting there. But what you will also notice is that the blue contact area, the bearing area, is now smaller. So our area of maximum contact of maximum bearing have reduced. So this has an implication in two ways. One, with those higher E values, they do center the lens better on uneven corneas. But because our area of bearing is becoming less, we've got less peripheral forces pushing the tissue into the reverse curve. And if the eccentricity there is too high, we run the risk of getting under correction in the center of the lens, leading to uh, under target powers or even slight central islands. So again, we don't want to go too high in the eccentricity. The same is then true by lowering the eccentricity. In this example, we went to 0 0.9. And you can see we've lost that U shape. It's now more a straight line. It's still acceptable, that will still work, but there is a risk because of that straight line, because the lens and the cornea is basically in alignment that it can create a bit of a sharp edge. And this can lead to some lens imprints in the mornings, especially with the lenses that exerts a lot of force under the cornea, the high powers. Um, so we do want that very slight U-shape sitting there and not completely the straight line. And if we go even lower in the eccentricity, we get the situation where the U-shape is now reversed. And this is an area we don't want to see. First of all, we're creating a pinch point. That's most likely going to cause some form of staining. And secondly, our contact point, our bearing area is quite small and narrow. And again, we're going to lose that outer peripheral to central forces on the cornea and that's not ideal. It's going to again lead to either under correction and or some form of imprint or even staining sitting on that cornea. Now the beauty of iSpace with the latest upgrade is the software now analyzes the corneal eccentricity over the horizontal meridian and then designs the alignment curve eccentricity as a flatter factor. So there's also variability in the alignment curve eccentricity. So if you're fitting a lower E cornea, the software will adjust the alignment curve of your forge lens to follow that lower eccentricity 
And if you are fitting a very high eccentric cornea, the software will adjust the eccentricity to be more so. So when one eye, an eccentricity of 1.2 is optimal, in another eye, 1.5 can be optimal, and in another eye, the one can be optimal. So again, what you're looking for on the simulation is that very slight U-shape sitting there, and on the horizontal, that U-shape can also be a bit toe-bearing. In other words, the outer part can be a bit lower than the inner part. So if I use this example here, you can see that area is a bit lower compared to there, and that's what we call the toe fit. So the alignment curve over the horizontal meridian, we want it to be slightly toe fitting, in other words, out, and it helps to stabilize the lens on the cornea, and it also helps to push tissue inwards and up into the reverse curve. Now, the next area we're gonna quickly talk about is the tilt function. The tilt function, you will find um, here, it says simulation, and next to it, there's a tab that says tilt and position. Now, tilting is something that's unique to virtual fitting. In other words, we don't see this uh, naturally. This is something that comes from virtual fitting. Now, the way to think of this is when we capture corneal maps, it's important to capture the map over its geometric center. In other words, if you look at your Placida disc rings, when you capture maps, those rings should be equidistant to the limbus. The outer border should be equidistant over the horizontal and in the vertical. If we get a scenario where we capture the cornea slightly off axis, research has shown that corneal topographers, because they're reflecting those placebo rings and then capturing the image, because they're coming in skew, those rings the, on the outer side has a different size to the inner. So it creates a erroneous data point. And so when the software tries to analyze the data, you can get erroneous data. So it's very important to get the geometric center of the cornea captured with your map. And we'll do another seminar where we will show you the same eye using a decentered map versus a geometric centered map and how radically that changes the design of the lens and therefore the outcome of the lens. For now, just know that if we do capture the lens slightly off center or certain corneas are tilted, when the software analyzes that cornea, so imagine uh, if you think of Marvel movies, you're looking at Tony Stark, he's grabbed your cornea, he's thrown it into one of those very fancy three-dimensional devices of his, and we have this cornea spinning in space. So we have this virtual cornea sitting in a computer space. Now the software grabs that information, designs the lens, and then places the lens on top of it. But if we capture a map that's slightly decentered, it's gonna create a scenario where there's a bit of a misalignment between the two. And so when the lens is simulated on the eye, the one area is gonna be closer to the cornea than the other. Now, this is not true. This is not what's going to happen when you place a lens on the eye with all the forces and the lids. That lens will drop down and settle. But as it drops down, as it comes down, the central tear form thickness will go a bit closer. And this changes the overall fit relationship of your lens on the eye. So we always want to make sure that when we're dealing with the simulation, that we've made sure that there's no tilt involved, that we tell the software where the exact point is. So again, the way to think of this, you're a jumbo jet airline pilot, it's basically fly by wire, you press a couple of buttons and the, the aircraft goes into the air. But the pilot is still needed to make small adjustments and take over when things are not going as planned. And it's very much the same idea with iSpace. If your map is not as good as it can be, it, it will be required from you to make small adjustments to optimize the lens simulation on the eye. And that's where the tilt function is for. So if you do notice that there's a bit of a tilt, and I'll show you in a minute how that works, we require you to first go to that tilt and position and just reorientate the lens in the simulation to allow the simulation to be as accurate as it possibly can. Now again, um, it does not change the design of the lens. It just makes it different to the way the simulation occurs 
on the art. I know there's a couple of questions on the chat. Um, I will come to that at the end and we can go through some of those questions. So if we look at the tilt, there's the simulation. So you can see the cornea and then the lens simulated on top of that cornea. So to the right, you can see the lens is touching, it's bearing, but on the left, the lens is slightly in the air. Now this is not a natural occurrence and we have to tell the software to correct that for us. So in the simulation, this is what we're looking at. You can see the blue on the right, your area of bearing, the contact point, but the area on the left, there's no blue over here. So if you look at the cross section on the right, you can see it's making contact, there's the bearing, but in the left, that alignment curve is in the air, which is not natural. So we have to ask the software to re-simulate the lens, but with the lens tilted, so the other side also touches the cornea. And we do this by simply going here and clicking on that one circle. We always click in the opposite direction of where the blue bearing is. So in this case, the bearing is to the right, so we will click on the 180. And that tells the software just to drop to tilt the lens in that direction only and allowing for a better fit. So if we look at it in real time, if I click on that 180, the software will re-simulate. Still not touching, so we'll click again. And now we see this blue on both sides. For those of you astute who have noticed the central tear film it became a bit less as we went along. So again, we're not changing the lens design at this point. We are just optimizing the lens simulation on the eye. Now, if you take a well-centered geometric map, if there's no ring jam, if you've got no tear film defects, chances are you don't need to do this. But if your map is decentered, if there's tear defects, um, ring jam, stuff like that, odds are you're gonna to have to start playing around with tilt to optimize it. And my advice to you is if you have to do too many changes, tilts and all design element changes, odds are the map is not as good as it should be. And I would rather go back and redo the map. And in later seminars, we'll show you what the implication is of using good versus poor maps. So that's the basic, that's the essence of designing the Forge Author K lens. So let's have a quick look at astigmatic Author K fitting. Now with Author K, when it comes to toric fits, we need to be aware of the elevation difference over the horizontal and vertical meridians, or the two primary meridians. So if the elevation difference over a nine millimeter cord is more than 30 microns, there's enough elevation difference for a toric lens to lock into position. If the elevation difference is less than 30 microns, you will have to say with a rotationally symmetric lens, because there is a risk if you design it as a toric lens that the lens won't lock into position. So you might get a scenario where tonight the lens is orientated in one way, tomorrow night it's sitting in another way, and the night thereafter it's rotating into a different position, which will leave uh, you in a scenario of this getting there but not perfect mold and it changes from day to day. So the first thing to look out for is the elevation difference. So if you grab an elevation map, it's quite easy to calculate it. You go four and a half millimeters from the center in one meridian, measure the elevation, and do the same in the opposite meridian. If the difference between those two values is more than 30 microns, you're good to go with a toric lens. Now, because this is work and it takes a long time and because you've got a busy practice, you don't want to go and sit and do this every time you design a lens to decide whether to do an RS lens, a rotation symmetric lens, or doing a toric lens. So I space made it easy for you. We just show you what the delta sag at nine millimeters is. So if you look at this line over here, these are 128 microns. And to make life even better, the software will automatically decide if that value is above 30, it will switch the design on your behalf to a toric. So you don't even have to do that on a manual basis. So let's see if we grab this cornea. If we take this cornea that's got 128 microns of elevation difference, but we decide to only design a rotation symmetric lens. 
we end up with a scenario that looks something like this. So the top cross section, you'll see the horizontal meridian, and then the bottom section there is the vertical meridian. Now, in the horizontal meridian, we've got a good author-k design going. It looks like we would expect a normal author-k lens to look like. We've got good alignment uh, of the alignment curve. We've got that central tear film clearance of 18 microns, and we're going to get decent seal happening on the outer periphery, meaning we can get that tissue to move into reverse curve from the outside as well as from the center. The issue here is what happens in the vertical. So in the vertical meridian, you'll see the alignment curve is not even close to the cornea. It's not an alignment, and there's a certain amount of tear film sitting there. Now, if the tear film value here in the alignment curve where the steep meridian is in the center, if that value is more than 30 microns, both top and bottom, that tells us we need to do a toric design. If it's more than 30 microns, we're not going to get proper seal and we're not going to get a proper reshape to occur in that meridian. So I want to welcome Jagrud as well. Um, Jagrud is my partner in crime here, and he will be answering all your chat questions as we go along. So welcome, Jagrud. Hey, guys. Um, so to get back to the vertical meridian, it's important that we get proper alignment here. If we don't, we're going to get a scenario where we get uh, improper reshaping happening in that vertical meridian. And this is typically what we'll see in the post-fit maps. So on the top left, we've got your astigmatic cornea. And in this map, we try to fit an RS lens on a highly toric cornea. So again, as I explained, over the horizontal meridian, we've got proper alignment. But in the vertical meridian, we don't have proper alignment. So if we look at the map in the horizontal, we can get the myopia correction going. So you can see we've uh, reduced the minus there, pushed the tissue outwards. But what's happened in the vertical is we're getting under correction. We're getting a vertical central island, if you wish. So this under correction of the uh, corneal tissue in that area. So what we've done is we've created more astigmatism. And you can see this if you look at the post-fit map. So you can see there's flattening there, and there's a more steeper profile sitting in the vertical. So instead of removing the astigmatism, we've left some of the astigmatism behind. And a study done by John Montford showed when you fit rotation symmetric lenses on toric corneas, you can expect about a 50 to 60% reduction of astigmatism um, in, in the vertical meridian. So how do we fix this? And the simple answer is we use eye space. Now with eye space, we have a unique feature where the software will analyze the horizontal meridian and analyze the vertical meridian separately. And it therefore then designs a separate author-k lens for the horizontal meridian and a separate design for the vertical meridian. So what we're doing is we're optimizing the lens design independently for each meridian and then we merge the two lenses together. So in this example, you can see the alignment curve is now much closer to the cornea. It's definitely less than that 30 microns. Typically, it sits at about five to eight microns in most cases. We don't want a complete touch there because we still want most of the weight bearing to occur over the horizontal alignment curve. And again, the reasoning for that is it helps with stabilization, but we do need a bit of tear flow in the vertical to help with that up and down movement. We also want that alignment curve to follow the uh, curve and the eccentricity of the cornea. So in this example, we have designed a quite a unique lens in the sense that it's a bitoric ortho K lens. So not only is the reverse curve, the Z zone atoric and the alignment curve atoric, but also the back optic zone radius is an atoric format. So again, the software will analyze what's required over the horizontal versus the vertical meridian. It will look at your spectacle description. It will look at the compression factors and then calculate the most optimal back optic zone 
for those parameters combined. And because this is a truly bitoric ortho K, remember your back vertex power will also be toric. So it's actually a bitoric ortho K lens when you come to the end result. And the beauty is iSpace does most of the heavy lifting, meaning you don't have to calculate all the information um, regarding. So let's look at the end result. So here we can now see that after the fact, after we have fitted that lens, we're getting a very different picture here. So we're getting an almost bullseye image developing here. And if we do a difference map, we can see because we fitted a bitoric lens, we get an independent power molding happening in the horizontal and an independent power molding happening in the vertical. So the reshape power is more in the vertical in this case because we fitted the bitoric than what it is in the horizontal meridian. But remember, this is not always the case. Many of your toric fits, the back optics and radius will be spherical, will be the same in both meridians. It's only if the optics dictate that a back toric is required, the software will calculate it out and it provides you with this more unique bullseye pattern than what we would normally expect. So in this example, for instance, we have a spectacle prescription that's minus one with a 250 cylinder and axis 40. Some of the older author K rules stated before we had toric lenses that the spherical power had to be double that of the sphere. Now in this example, we can show with these toric designs, it's not necessary. So, and this is also an oblique fit. So if you look at the imagery here, there's the engraving line, there's the engraving line from the simulation, and you can see the similarity between what the software predicts the lens fit will look like and what the lens fit itself will look like. And again, because we're fitting a bitoric design here, there'll be less of a reverse curve sitting in the flat meridian relative to the steep meridian. And when we combine this lens and when we do the reshape, we end up with corneas that looks something like this. So you can see here where the flat meridian is very low in minus, there's very little reverse tissue sitting here in the mid periphery, whereas where the astigmatism was higher, we've got more tissue bunching up into that mid peripheral zone. And for those of you who uh, have the oculus, if you do your 3D uh, imagery, you get this very interesting higher, lower reverse curve topography that's quite fancy to show to your patients. So you can see as we're getting more complex in our lens designs, we are moving away from that classical bullseye pattern. So the more wonderful and weird designs we come up with, the more wonderfully weird our topography maps will look afterwards. So always just keep in mind what you are trying to attempt with your lens and what you expect the post-fit maps to look like, um, as not all of them will always be um, bullseye patterns. So the other area of interest, uh, especially for me, is I like to do the post lasic cases. So if you have a number of author K cases, uh, post lasic cases rather, and you're looking for those post lasic cases that's not too distorted. So it's a good laser pattern, except that there's a bit of under or over correction. So your typical case would be um, a female who wanted the author for their laser done because she wants to play tennis and after the procedure she still ended up with a minus 075 or minus one the optic under correction. Now she's not keen on going back for laser and as you know secondary and third lasers can have more complications so why not offer the opportunity of author K and so designing an author K lens we can after the laser come in and remold and reshape elements of that cornea to improve the vision and correct that under correction and minus. So in this example, you can see the post lassic cornea. So they look almost like author K. And again, we're looking for pristine lassic cases. If they are too distorted, you're going to struggle getting a proper seal. We will then pull those maps into eye space and then as per normal design author K lenses on top of those maps. The only difference with most of these maps is you won't find that very clear, well demarcated center treatment zone, which just shows you with the laser that treatment zone can be 
a bit uneven. And it's one of the reasons some of these people do struggle with nighttime vision. So with Author K, when we design it, we don't necessarily always look at the central tear film thickness. We want to click in a couple of areas and make sure that the closest area in that treatment zone is more than 10 microns. So it might end up that it's 10 microns sitting over here, but 20 or 30 microns in this area. So as long as the closest point has about a 10 micron space, and we've designed the lens for the corneal bearing to be over the horizontal alignment curve, you should be good to go. So once we fitted these lenses, the patients will sleep with them like any normal ortho K lens, and we are then capable of reshaping these post lassie cases with the ortho K lenses. So there's a bit of a niche market for those of you who are interested in this. It does work well. Uh, I've had a number of patients over the last 10, 12 years who's been wearing these lenses with great success. So definitely something to consider. And you don't have to do anything different to what you normally would. You would just normally bring your map into iSpace and then design the ortho -K lens as you would normally do. You might have to optimize certain areas a bit more and then you are good to go. So this is another example, just to show you the pre and the post fit. And with, with most of these lectures, we do like to brag. So this was quite a, a nice case. We don't always get it so comfortably uh, in the high minuses, but in this classic case, we corrected four and a half diopters of uncorrected myopia. So they're not always as great as this, but it's just showing you that it is possible to do that. And in this example, we did a toric design. So top left, you can see a attempt at toric correction in laser. Uh, didn't end up quite where they planned it. So the patient had a post of Rx of minus 075075. And so we went in afterwards with the ortho K lens and we managed to correct the balance of that um, correction. So one other off-label use for the forged lens is to convert it over to a reverse geometry day wear lens. And so one of the areas you can play with this is when you're dealing with RK cases. Now, for those of you who know who try and fit RK cases with normal GP spherical lenses, you always end up with a scenario where there's too much central tear from thickness, or if you reduce the central tear from thickness, you have a scenario where your outer edge of the lens, the edge lift off is quite excessive. So one way to fix this is to try and fit a reverse geometry lens that follows the contour of that LASIK, uh, the RK case more closely. Now we know we can't do ortho K on RK cases because of the scarring, but you can modify the lens as a day wear lens. What you would do in this scenario is import the map into iSpace. And again, it needs to be a good map. We will then put the prescription in and design an ortho K lens. The difference here is instead of using the suggested back optic zone radius, we will change the back optic zone radius back to the flat K value. And from there, we'll just design the lens out. And again, the same principles apply. We want that bearing to sit underneath the alignment curve. And once you've done this, you've ensured you've got a proper edge lift. You can then order that lens and dispense it as a day wear lens. So that's just another off-label suggestion of using the Forge as a template. Now, myopia management's become a big topic and these different philosophies out there as to what constitutes an optimal lens for myopia control when it comes to ortho K fitting. And it's not the purpose of today to tell you what lens is better, but what I rather would like to show you is how you can modify the Forge Ortho K lens to follow the particular philosophy that you are most comfortable with. So to start off with, um, I want to highlight this paper that was uh, put out by Noel Brennan. And he looked at a couple of things that lacked um, robust evidence. And one of the things that he noticed here, in some of the statements we are currently using, uh, there's not enough data that supports it as evidence-based. And one of them 
is the relative peripheral hyperopia. Now, I'm sure with the lecture that uh, KT is doing tomorrow, we'll get a lot more information. So let's see what comes out of there. But there is thinking that these other models that might make sense as well. And one of them will be the retinal confusion model, which we'll learn more as time passes. So for the purpose of now, I'd like to concentrate quickly on a poster that was presented by Professor Eddie Chow. Now, this is a poster that he presented where he showed when you reduced the back optic zone diameter and you make the back optic zone an A sphere. In other words, you introduce an eccentricity value to that. He felt in this poster that he got better myopia control. So, what is the theory? So the theory is we want to reduce the back optic zone radius so we can introduce more plus into the pupillary zone. And to further aid this, we want to increase the eccentricity of that back optic zone radius. Now, interestingly, with the retinal confusion theory that might come out, we're just looking for a range of change over the retinal a confusion that's created over the retina and the eccentricity might be beneficial for that time will tell so if we look at the design according to eddie uh, a standard ortho k lens uh, forge lens will have variable optic zones which i'll show you in a minute so in this example it's 6.6 .6, and the eccentricity of that optic zone radius uh, was zero it's a sphere now Eddie promotes that we need to make the lens smaller. His suggestion was amongst others 5.4 and then increasing the eccentricity to 1.3. And you can see from the simulations there how the optic zone becomes smaller and the central area becomes more aspheric. And if we look at it from a fit perspective, you can see on the left the standard design and on the right the myopia control design based on that paper as it was posted. Now, there's gonna be different theories around this, and you might find that you wanna follow Eddie's theory, and I'll show you in a minute how to do this. You might listen to Katie or Noel or somebody else, speaking of myopia control, and you might find you like their philosophy better, and you wanna apply that to the lens. The beauty of eye space is whatever philosophy you're gonna follow for myopia control to optimize your ortho -K lens, iSpace will offer you the opportunity to do that. And I'll show you in a live demo in a minute. So as I said, any of the questions that you have, uh, please feel free to ask that on the chat section. Um, Jagrid's busy typing away and answering, and it's also available on our knowledge base. So I'm gonna stop the share here at the moment. And if you give me a second, I wanna bring it us to a live fit scenario. So let's just close that window and we're going to open eye space. So at the moment, you're welcome to ask any questions. Um, you just unmute and you can fire away. I'm just busy getting the eye space software up and running. So when we first enter iSpace, this is what the opening page will look like. So we have on the top there um, a number of menu options, select patient, right eye, left eye, and submit order. And we then have a list of your patients sitting over here. Now, when you open iSpace for the first time, there will be a number of demonstration maps in there, or demonstration patients. And this is fixed in with iSpace. So any of the knowledge base articles that you will follow, any of the demonstrations that we do, we will typically use this map so you can follow along. As you start importing your own patient uh, database, there will be more patients sitting over there. So let's look at a very standard design to start off with. That's the spherical eye. We will then go to the right eye. So if you wanna design a right lens, you will click on the right eye menu option if you want to design a left lens, you will click on the left eye. So on this side, we're going to click on right eye, and there's my MedMont map already imported. So I will click on it, and that is the actual map. Um, if it's the MedMont map, you can look at the placebo disk imagery as well. 
Um, and you can look at tangential powers just like you would normally do in your MedMod. So the next step is I say new lens. So I tell the software I want to use this particular map and I want to design a new lens. Then I tell it what design I want to do. In this case, it's going to be the forge lens. So I click forge. Now, if you're working with an Oculus, you will have to manually enter the HVID. So on your Oculus topographer, they've got built-in measuring tools. Just use the built-in caliper and just measure the cornea. You can do the same with Medmont, but the Medmont allows to import the actual uh, Posita disk map, and then therefore we can measure the HVID within our space. So what we do in this scenario is we want to move on the horizontal meridian, black to black, we want to pull that caliper right through the center of the cornea to the opposite side, black to black. And in this scenario, the map's about 11.35, and I click Save. Next step is I enter my spectacle description. We'll keep it simple for now, and we'll make it minus 3.5 diopters. I click Done. And the software now analyzes the cornea and designs our OrthoK lens for us. So I'm just going to open up that imagery a little bit. So again, we have the screen there. So um, we've got those sections over there. We've got the corneal data on the left. We have the uh, information regarding the lens parameters, and then we have the simulation. Now, because we're using a good map, um, the software did a good job of getting the tilt function done. So you'll see the area of most bearing is over the horizontal alignment curve, and we've got bearing on both sides, meaning that it is balanced. The next step then is when that's balanced is we want to look at the edge lift. So in this case, the edge lift is around about 90 microns. Now one of the nice features is if you take your mouse button, click the left, hold it in, and zoom in, you can get a zoomed in version of the edge. So if we look here, that value is sitting around about the 90 micron value. So that's good. That's the kind of edge lift we're aiming for. So let's run through all the parameters. We used a minus 350 diopter target power. The back optic zone radius is nine millimeters, Z zone 365. The alignment curve is 735, and the eccentricity of that alignment curve is 0 0.9. So this is stuff the software automatically calculated based on the information. And if you have a look here, we've got that very slight U shape sitting over there um, and we've got that proper alignment. So in the vertical, we've got about 14 millimeters of space. Now, when I click on any point on the simulation, left click, it will go, give me an exact central tear film thickness of that position under the lens. And the top section will show me a cross section of where I've just clicked. So because I've clicked there, it shows me the 15 microns, exactly where I've clicked on it. And it will do a cross section to the bottom of the lens, which we'll see towards the left here. And then the bottom cross section will be 90 degrees opposite to that. If I click on the oblique, there's my tear profile running across here, and then the bottom cross section will be 90 degrees apart from that. So anywhere on the eye, or on the lens rather, I can click and get an exact central tear form thickness value of the eye there. So let's look at diameter quickly. So iSpace will look at your HVID and then design the lens 0 0.2 millimeters smaller than the HVID. So the lens is fitted quite large. Now there's two advantages going large on the lens. One, it helps with stabilization. So what we find from all the troubleshoots, monitoring all of them, in all the cases where we find lenses decenter overnight, enlarging the lens, making the diameter bigger, helped to stabilize the lens and gave us better centration. So by default, all the eye space lenses designed now with the new version will be larger, 0.2 millimeters smaller than HVID. So it is important that you do measure the HVID accurately, otherwise your lens might end up too large. Now, because we're fitting so close to the limbus and we know that a lot of eyes, the vertical 
uh, limbal diameter is smaller than the horizontal, there is a risk that the lens can ride onto the vertical limbus. So to counteract that, we increase the edge lift. So for the Forge Ortho K lens, we want the edge lift to sit somewhere between 80 and 100 microns over the horizontal meridian. So if I click apply here, you'll see that the edge lift here, which is the top of that triangle, currently is sitting at 90 microns, which is great. That's where we want it to be. To show you how to change it very quickly, all I need to do is go to the edge radius value. If I want to decrease the edge lift, I would simply this decrease the value here. So let's make that 9.7 and the edge lift will decrease. If I want to increase the edge lift, I just increase the edge lift value, the radius value, and my edge lift will increase over the horizontal and vertical meridian. But specifically, our measuring point, the value we're after is the edge lift in the horizontal should be lying between that 80 and 100 mark. The next thing we can look at very quickly is the back optic zone diameter. So if you open up iSpace, it can look like this. If you want to see the advanced parameters, just click on that tick box. It opens the advanced parameters. The back optic zone diameter, again, works on a sliding scale. In other words, the less target power you have, the less minus you're correcting, the bigger the optic zone would be. The higher the minus, the smaller the back optic zone diameter will become. So the biggest will be seven, and it comes down now to 6.2 on the higher powers. Now, importantly, if your back optic zone is 6.4, like it is in this example, please don't make it larger. You're more than welcome to make it smaller, that's fine. But if you make it larger, you are running the risk of getting an underpowered reshape. That optic zone size is optimal for that power correction. And if you go larger, there is a risk that it, the lens just doesn't have enough reshape forces to flatten off that central area. And you might end up with under correction or a very mild central island. So if you go smaller, it doesn't matter. Remember from Mandel's rule, you can go smaller for the higher powers, but you can't go larger. So please don't enlarge that uh, back optic zone diameter. So what we find in troubleshooting, what happens on occasion is people fill a lens, the lens is not optimal on the eye. And the moment we don't have optimal reshape forces, the moment the alignment curve is not sealing properly, lens is not large enough, we don't have the exact central tear from thickness, we get this under correction happening in the middle, and one of the side effects is the treatment zone size will be smaller. So the first thing people would like to do at that point is they want to flatten the back optic zone radius and enlarge the back optic zone diameter. And if your lens is already ill-fitting, enlarging the back optic zone diameter is going to make it worse. Um, because you're really struggling to get all the forces to work and now you need better even forces to make that bigger optic zone work. So we find if you rather redesign the lens to have an optimal alignment curve and fit relationship, by default, the optic zone will open up to its maximum potential. So it's a bit counterintuitive when you see a small optic zone and you get optic zones that are small relative to the pupil, but in typically these underdeveloped cases, they are quite small. And that's why the patient's struggling and you'll end up with this minus 050 or minus 075 under correction. So small optic zone with a residual minus 075, that's a recipe for night vision uh, disaster. And people will complain bitterly about this. So when we re-optimize the lens, the optic zone by nature because all the forces are working well, will open up by default. So please don't enlarge the back optic zone diameter. The eccentricity we'll look at in a minute. Then the other new function in the updated software is the Z-zone width. Now the Z-zone width uh, is the width from the point here where the back optic zone radius stops and the Z-zone begins and where the Z-zone ends. So it's the width there. Now, what we found with the high minus powers, because this reverse curve goes up so high, and when it comes down, the angle here where all those curves meet are quite 
sharp. And that's sometimes why we get those lens imprints. So what the software is doing now is it's got a sliding scale. So the more minus we're correcting, the wider that Z zone width will go. And the less minus we're correcting, the narrower that Z zone width will go. So the software again will calculate that automatically and you don't have to worry about that. But just if you see that changing, that's linked to the amount of target power that you're aiming to correct. We talked about the alignment curve eccentricity that controls that U-shape under the alignment curve. The edge width typically you won't change. That just controls the base of this triangle. And then the edge radius is um, where we can lift or decrease the edge lift. So let's look at changing some of the parameters. So at this point, you've noticed I haven't done anything to the lens yet, except play with the uh, edge lift. So if you were just designing a normal ortho K lens, this lens is done. We're now ready to order it. And how would you go about that? Is we click add to cart. Now when we click add to cart, um, a new page or pane will open up and it will show you the back vertex power of that lens. So that would be the measurement that you'll see in your vitometer when you measure the lens in A. That's the plus power on the lens. Now that is essentially correcting for the tear power, the so-called Jessen factor or compression factor. And again, that works on a sliding scale. The other nice feature is the residual astigmatism. Now this value shows you the expected refraction over lens. When you place the lens on the eye, you can expect that prescription to be there. And what we're watching for is the value of the um, astigmatism there. We don't want that value to be higher than minus one diopters. If it's higher than minus one, you have to ask yourself the question, why is it there? Um, is it because there's really lenticular astigmatism present in the system? Or is it because of my corneal map having erroneous data and therefore it's not correlating with my spectacle prescription and it can induce that residual astigmatism. Now keep in mind by changing the back optic zone radius might artificially make that residual astigmatism look better but it, but it still won't do its job when the lens does the molding on the eye. So that's a warning sign. That's something that if that astigmatism is high, you should stop at this point and revisit all the information. In particular, what we're after is looking at the flat and, and steep K values and in the axis of the flat axis relative to, for instance, the axis of your spectacle prescription. If they differ by more than 20 microns, the odds are there's some residual astigmatism there. And remember, these values are calculated from your map. So if your map has tier defects, if you've captured the decentered map, that data can be skewed and therefore does not relate properly to your spectacle prescription. And when the calculation's done, you're going to end up with residual astigmatism. So that's a dashboard warning light. If you see high astigmatism there, you have to stop and think for a moment, where is that coming from? And not just go ahead and place the order or at least place the order and the review so we can help you to ascertain where the problem is. 90% of the time, it's because of the map. And you'll see me harping on about good maps, good maps, but that is a secret. Um, if you wanna stay out of the troubleshooting chair, spend time taking good, well-centered maps with no tier defects. So at this point, we're happy. We've got uh, some residual astigmatism, which is normal. Keep in mind, all eyes will have about a minus 050, minus 075 against the rule lenticular astigmatism. So it's not unusual to have some of that there. So we're happy with that. And we now say add to cart. So we've done our right eye. We've placed it in the shopping cart. And we can now go ahead and do the left eye, repeat the whole process and add to cart. Once we're done and we want to order the lens, we go to submit order and the software will automatically pull up your practice details. If you've got more than one practice, you can then specify in this drop down box to which address you want that lens to be shipped. 
then you can decide if you want to order the lens as per case. In most regions, per case will give you two free remakes over 180 days period. In other words, you pay for the first lens, the second lens and the third lens that you order for this patient will be no charge to you if it is within that 180 days of the first order. So six months is a particular long time. That's plenty time, even in COVID these days times, um, to get a fit sorted out. So if you would like it as a per case, and I strongly suggest if you do new fits that you do, you would click next, uh, next or yes. If you wanted this per lens, you would click no. So in this example, I'm gonna click yes. Uh, there's my right lens parameters. I can decide if I want to stay with the default Boston X or violet material, or I can use the drop down box and decide I rather want it to be in the green material. And there is the final lens. From this point, you have two order options. The one on the right is order. If you click it here, that lens design will run straight through to the manufacturing lab and the lens gets produced. If you're uncertain or you would somebody to review your case, that's when you will click on the review option. The review option will place the order on your behalf, but it will be sent to your consultant, your troubleshooter. Now, myself or Alan or Kendrew or Mariska will open this up on their side. They will then download all the relevant information go through the fit, double check or everything, and then approve it and it gets designed or make a change, upload the new design and then send your lens off to the lab for manufacture. And then when they upload the new design, they will then add commentary for you. Uh, did a great job, but you know perhaps we could have done the following um, and this is the reason why we did it. And so therefore it becomes a learning experience as well. So as you progress, as you get more confident with the lens designs, you might want to move away from review to order, but then you might hit a particularly interesting or difficult case and you would like somebody just to review it again with you and then you'll use the review option. If you're a first time fitter, and you're a bit unsure of what's going on, by default, just use the review. Now, as a new customer, we put the training views on. So initially all the orders you place will automatically go under review. If you feel the training wheels can come off, you can let us know and we'll unclick it on the back end and the orders will go through live and we don't review any of those cases. Okay, so that's the basic backing of ordering. Let's quickly go back to our design and let's just see how we can modify things here. So let's say you did attend the lecture. You like that idea of Eddie in the sense that he wanted to make his back optic zone smaller and he wanted to increase the eccentricity value. So how we go about this is we go to the back optic zone diameter, which currently is 6.4, and let's change that to 5.4 like he suggests. Now at this point, if I click apply, the software will just follow your instructions. It won't think about what it's doing. It's you just say, do it. And it says, I'm doing it. So if I click apply, because I've changed the diameter of the back optic zone, the whole fit relationship changed. And you can see the central tear foam thickness is now incorrect. So without knowing the numbers, just looking at its simulation, you know, something is wrong. So how do we fix this? Now you can sit here for the next five minutes and try and figure out how much I need to decrease the Z zone value to get to an appropriate central tear from thickness. But if you're in a busy practice, you don't have time to do this. So we made it easy. So rather we click the optimized alignment curve in Z zone. So based on the new information, iSpace will then look at everything and then re-optimize the lens given the new information that you've entered. And so you can see the back optic zone is a lot smaller. The alignment curves uh, was readjusted accordingly. So let's say, hang on, a smaller optic zone is not the only thing I want. I also want higher eccentricity. So I can then go into the back optic zone eccentricity and then modify that to the value that I prefer. In this case, it's 1.3. And instead of doing apply, we just jump directly to optimize and we click optimize. And the software will grab the new information and then redesign the lens based on the new back optic zone information 
that you've given it. Let's say you look at that alignment curve and you say, hang on, I do think I want a bit more of a U shape. You can go, for instance, to the alignment curve eccentricity, change that value perhaps to one. And the same story, whenever you change anything here on the bottom column, it's best to go to optimize um, and the software will re-optimize the fit. And you can see it's got a slight more U shape to it. And so depending on your clinical preferences, you can make these changes to the lens and then click optimize and the software will redesign the lens accordingly. Let's say you decide um, that seven microns is a bit close. So you fitted this lens and there is a bit of a central stain. You want to increase the central tear film thickness by five microns. The simplest thing to do is go to the Z zone. Currently it's 305 microns. We add five microns to that and so we make it 310. We can't use optimize now because if we go back to optimize and I'll do it, you'll see it will revert back to the value it chose. So in this case, we want to overrule the software and we say apply. And we've increased the Z zone by five microns, which means we've increased the central tear film thickness by five microns. So that's how we will go about to make modifications to the lens. So I know we, we kind of flung into the system. If you want to bear with me, I'll show you one or two more examples. So let's go with something a little bit more complex. We're going to go uh, towards a toric design. So in this example, we have a cornea that's 3.5 doctors of corneal astigmatism. So this is typically one of those cases where you'll start shying away from ortho K unless you have eye space, because we're going to show you how easy it is to do it. So in this case, we're going to click new lens again. We're going to say it's a forged lens. I've already measured the HVAD on a previous occasion, so I've remembered it. Otherwise, you can go in and enter it again. We're going to take a spectacle prescription. Let's make this minus 4, minus 350, and axis 10. And we'll click that. So the software is analyzing the data. It's looking at the shape and it designs an appropriate ortho -K lens for that cornea. So let's run through it quickly. So we have a 9.4 optic zone here. We've got the Z zone values, the alignment curves. You can see because the delta sag is 128 microns, uh, the software automatically defaulted to a toric design. It wasn't necessary for us to say, uh, do a toric design software did it automatically it then went about and it designed a lens on the horizontal meridian we can see where the line engravings are they orientate to the flat meridian and then we have the steep meridian in this area here so the first thing we want to look at is the tilt where is my area of most bearing and you can see we now have this tripod scenario so the weight is not completely over the horizontal, but we do still have stability in the sense the lens won't really tilt in any direction. And let me show you. So if I click in this direction, theoretically as the lens tilts there, that blue, that bearing is already touching, it will stop it. But let's see if we click more to the left, you can see all the weight distribution, the bearing is now there. So it means the lens definitely won't go in that direction. If I click in the opposite direction, Again, the blue is on the other side. It will stop the lens from tilting. So there it doesn't look completely to be in that horizontal manner. It's still balanced over the horizontal. So I'm quite happy with that. I'll look at my edge lift. And again, my edge lift is between that 80 and 100 microns. So again, if I zoom in, those with smaller screens, you can see it's sitting there at the 90 micron mark. So I don't need to make any changes there. Because we're dealing with high minus, because the uh, vertical will be sitting with the three and a half doctors of myopia correction, the software increased the central tear film thickness for us to allow that reserve space if the lens settles down. So essentially, um, I don't have to do a thing further. It's checking all my boxes and I can go ahead and order this Toric Ortho K lens, which is pretty straightforward. Let's say I want to do myopia control. Um, I've listened to a different lecture. 
and I decide I want to make my optic zone 5.8 and I want a 1.2 eccentricity on my back optic zone, I will click apply. The software will then reanalyze and then re-optimize the lens given those new parameters. Now, what we do see here, there is definitely more weight distribution towards the vertical. So there is possibly a slight risk that the lens can decenter left or right. So this is a great example where we can come in and make some small modifications. So let's look at the horizontal quickly. So if I click here, you'll see the alignment curve is not bearing, it's not on the cornea. If I click in the vertical, the weight is there. In other words, if I can use my house analogy, the current weight of the roof is balanced over the vertical wall system. In other words, that wall is weight bearing where the wall in my horizontal is non-weight bearing, my foundation's in the air. So what I would like to do is lower the foundation over the horizontal meridian or lift the uh, foundation here. So I want to either decrease the Z zone in the steep meridian in this area, or I want to increase the Z zone in this area. So now I go and look at my central tear form thickness. If I lower the wall in the vertical, the roof is going to drop until the weight is carried by the horizontal area. Or I can increase my horizontal Z zone until the feet, the foundation is touching there and it becomes load bearing. So I'll show you both examples so you can see what's going to happen. So in the first example, I'm going to increase the Z zone in the flat meridian. In other words, make that wall more longer. I want to add more bricks into there in order for this foot to come down for my foundation to come and touch onto the cornea. So to do this, I go to my flat meridian. I take my Z zone and I add a brick into there. So we're going to make that to 70 microns. Now, I just made a mistake there on purpose. So it should have been 370 microns. I put in 270. You can immediately see something's wrong. So that's the beauty of our space. You can instantly see when you do something wrong. Now, if you don't remember what the value was, the simplest thing to do is just re-click the optimize function and the software will take it back to its base calculation. And now, ah, oh, it should have been a 370. I can go ahead and click 370 in there and click apply. So what we see instantly is the weight distribution is now moving back to the horizontal. And my central tear form thickness increased by about a micron. Let's go back to 265. Sorry, let's make that 365. We click apply. The other route I could have taken is I could have decreased this value, made that 425 and click apply. So we're getting the same result. The difference now is we've reduced our central tear from thickness. So the whole lens lowered down a little bit. So depending on what you're aiming for, if you wanted the central tear from thickness to be lower, you would have gone with that approach. If you wanted the central tear from thickness to be more, you would have gone with the other approach. Let's say you've done it this way and you decide, hang on, no, I want that a little bit more. So what I'll do is I'll go to here, I'll change that to 370, so five microns more, but because I want to keep that bearing relationship, I will then also increase the Z zone over here, back to 430, click apply. So it will keep the same relationship, but the overall central tear form thickness increased, the overall sagittal height of the lens increased. So these are the subtle things uh, that we can change on the lens to optimize the fit. With the other optimization of work, if I just didn't do anything, um, the odds are it would have worked because we only made a five microns difference. But by doing it this way, we just helped to, to stabilize the lens a little bit better and we should get a better molding action going on. So it's that subtlety that really molds the system for all that it's worth. So those are two easy maps. Allow me one map that is not so optimal. So let's find one that's gonna be interesting. Uh, and let's pull that up. So if we look at this map, first of all, let's go and look at the PC image. Hopefully you can see it there. 
Um, it's pretty centered geometrically. In other words, our Placida disk image over here, um, the edge here is more or less equidistant there. We do have a lot of lash shadow over here. We've got that tear meniscus sitting over here, so we expect some tear defects to develop here. And if I look at my Placida rings, they're not all smooth. Some of them are a bit wavy. Now, it's not very clear for you looking at this, but if you look at your own system, try and have a look at those, especially those first inner three to five millimeters must be crisp and clear because that's where your sim k values and where the average corneal data is coming from. If you look at the map itself, if you look at the pattern over here, we can see it's non-symmetrical. So that already is another warning sign. If you've got a Medmont, have a look at your indices. You want them all to be green. Um, if you use an Oculus, you also have an indices uh, tab over there and look for the aberration value. It should be down to zero. So this is not a bad map. We can still use it, but because there's a bit of tier defects in there, we can expect when we design the lens, we'll have to manipulate one or two things a bit more. Um, so I've done a basic design. Um, let's quickly have a look. I'm going to click new lens. Still use the forge. And uh, let's go with a minus 550 like I used before. So this is a real life map. This is one of the troubleshooting maps that I received. Um, so this is typically the stuff we'll get on a day and day basis to try and troubleshoot. So I click done. So hopefully you can see the repetitive nature of what we're doing. My first thing I want to do is I want to go to the bottom right of the page and I want to look at my simulation and I'm also noticing my very blue patch. So we can see there's a lot of weight sitting at the uh, call it one to three o'clock position and nothing at the opposite. So if I click on this area, I can see there's my area of bearing and in the opposite area, we have non-bearing. Because my Delta SAG nine millimeter cord is at 65 microns, the software opted to do a toric design, um, which is understandable. So first step here is I need to tilt. So I'll go up here, I click tilt and position, and now I wanna click in the opposite direction of where the blue is. So let's go downwards. So I still need to do more. <coughs> and now I can see by coming down, I'm getting bearing on the left side as well. So now I'm balancing it out. Now, at this point, I can tell you we are done. We don't have to do anything more. Some of you might say, hang on, but the blue is more on the right than on the left. And this is the nature of optometry. Of all optometrists, we want it to look even. I can tell you at this point, you don't need to change it. But for theory, let's quickly run through it. So if you look at the top section over here, there's something that called lens tilt. Now, I want to unclick this for a moment and click apply. So if you can see, this is the default where the software came up with. And it shows you the amount of tilt it's already corrected for uh, on this particular fit. So the zero 180 degree, in this case, the horizontal meridian is reflected over here. And then the vertical 9270 is reflected over here. Now this works the same way as graphs will work. So if you remember on the x-axis, if we move to the left, uh, our values will go more minus. If we go to the right, more plus. If we go up on the y-axis, the value becomes more plus. If we go down, the value becomes more minus. So if I click in the 270 degree meridian here, we're going to tilt the lens down. Notice what's happening here. So every time I click here, that value will change by 0 0.05. So it changes in 0.05 steps. I'm going to click once, and that value is going to go more minus because it's y-axis. We came down. It's subtracted 0 0.05. I'm going to click again and it's now 3.25. Note that there's a tick box. The moment you see a tick box over there, it means you superseding the software. You've made a clinical decision and you're writing manually. You've taken the autopilot off and you've made adjustments. Now, let's say I wanna click in this direction. So because the blue is more here, it might be there's more bearing over here. 
I want you to notice the central tear film thickness, which is 13. I'm going to click 180, and now I'm too far to the other side. Notice on the top side here, that value is now changed. It's ticked, meaning we've interfered. It's become 0 0.61. If I click to the right, that value will increase by 0 0.05. It will end up as 66. So if I click here, 66. So that 0 0.05 step is too much to get that balance. So you want to you want to change that by a lesser step. Because we're going left, we want to go minus, but we don't want to change that value by 05. Let's just change it by 04. So half of that roughly will be that two. So we're going to make that a 64. I click apply. And now we can see the blue is more evenly distributed. Did it make too much of a change in the center? Not really, it's like a micron or two. Was it clinically necessary? Most likely not. But I'm looking at all your faces, and the moment I did that, you all went, ha, oh, it's better. And that's just the nature of optometrists. We want it to look the same. So there's the trick if you really want to take time and get it balanced. Keep in mind it does take time, that's not necessary. Um, so if you're busy, don't worry about it. But there we go. Because we've made those little changes, we just want to ask the software, just check for me if the lens is still optimized. And I'm asking the software just to re-optimize the, uh, the design for me. It's a great, I'm happy. I just want to increase your central tear form thickness up to 21 microns because we're dealing with a high minus case. So again, we don't have to worry about that too much. Now, if I look at my edge lift, remember the optimal edge lift is about 100 between 80 and 100. So in this case, it's 110. You might argue, oh, that's not gonna make much of a difference, and I would agree with you, but just for the purpose of this, let's keep between an 80 and 100. So I want to reduce the edge radius here. So to do that, I go to my 97, and I will reduce that, let's call it down to 95. Click apply, and there we go. I'm sitting at my 100 mark, so now I've optimized it. Central tear form thickness looking good. I've got my blue bearing sitting over the horizontal meridian. My edge lift is looking good. Um, so all's fine, and I can go ahead and order this lens. Should I want to go ahead and optimize the optic zone for myopia control, I can then do that by changing those two values. So there's a lot more we can talk about. Uh, we can look at the optical analysis. Just very quickly, the ocular refraction is plotted here. We've got our tear power here, and then the calculation for the ideal back vertex power to neutralize that tear power. So this is how we calculate the overall back vertex power. Our lens schematic, you can uh, place any chord value in here, and at that particular point, it will show you the sag height of the lens, radius of curvature, and cone angle, for those of you mathematically inclined. And if you want to make any private notes, you are welcome to do it over there. So at this point, um, I'm going to stop the live demo. Um, I do want to thank you for your time. I know it's been long, um, and you've been very, very good at listening. So thank you for all of that. If there's any questions, as Jagrut said, please email us at charl at ispacelenses.com or jagrut at ispacelenses.com or feel free to visit our ispacelenses.com website. Um, as I said, there's an extensive knowledge base there. It's constantly being updated um, and you are more than welcome to have a look. So for now, I would like to say thank you. Have a great morning, afternoon or evening and we'll see you on the next round. Thank you.